Hello, everybody. Great Horn Spoon, Chapter 6, Spoiled Potatoes. Day after day, the two gold ships beat their way north along the ragged coast of Chile. Black smoke boiled up from their funnels and headwinds spun it out into long streamers. Jack sat on a keg and Praiseworthy stood over him with a pair of scissors. The boy's hair had shot up like broom straw during the long passage through the strait, and Praiseworthy had no intention attention of letting it grow any longer. Hold still. I'm holding still, said Jack. Still as I can. Praiseworthy snipped away. You'll be a young man before your Aunt Arabella sees you again. She may forgive me, you getting your height like a sapling. Praiseworthy, said Jack. Do you really think we'll strike it rich? No doubt about it. The wind carried away snippets of yellow hair. Maybe all the gold nuggets will be dug up before we get there. Nonsense. There'll be enough for all. But in the privacy of his thoughts, Praiseworthy didn't believe for a moment that they would be stubbing their toes on lumps of gold. Still, he must see to it that young Master Jack did indeed strike it rich. It would not do to return to Boston without a sack or two of treasure. Why, some of the passengers had brought along chests and boxes to be filled with nuggets and gold dust. As Praiseworthy clipped away, passengers stood around watching and offering advice. Even a haircut broke the monotony of those endless days at sea. Needs a little more of a snip on the port side, said Dr. Buckby, who had thrown away his alarm trumpet and regained his good humor. Nah, said Mountain Jack, work them shears along the starboard beam there, praiseworthy. That's where it wants even an up a mite. A shout from the lookout drew everyone's attention to the sea raven astern. She stopped making smoke, Captain. Smoke had indeed stopped billowing from her funnel. Captain Swain came out on deck and gave the ship a squint. Her coal bunkers are empty, he said. She went around the horn. We save fuel slipping through the strait, but we're not in much better shape ourselves, gentlemen. If this wind doesn't turn around, we'll be burning our last lump of coal soon enough. By the end of the day, the sea raven slipped entirely from view behind the horizon. Praiseworthy took no comfort from Lady Wilma's lead. It's the end of the race that counts, he said again. The wind didn't turn around. It died completely. The Lady Wilma was able to keep steam up in her boiler for almost a week. One day grew warmer than the next, and soon the gold seekers were peeling off coats and sweaters. Jack shucked off his shoes and took to climbing the rat lines. The tarred hemp ladders stretched up to the mast tops. Wearing a stocking cap the first mate had given him, he would spend hours in the crow's nest seeing the world. There were times when he felt he could see almost to California. The day came when the last shovel full of coal was scraped out of the bins. The boiler fi fire burned out. The merry thrash and throb of the side wheel ceased, and the Lady Wilma sat be calmed. Day after day, the gold ship languished on the sea, waiting for a good wind to fill her canvas. A week passed, two, and then fresh water in the tanks got dangerously low, and Captain Swain ordered it rationed for drinking only. From the crow's nest, Jack looked down on the gold seekers wandering the decks like caged men. One day, Praiseworthy came up the rat lines, bowler hat, umbrella, and all, and they watched for whales to pass the time. Is Aunt Arabella an old maid? Jack asked solemnly. An old maid, replied Praiseworthy. He leaned his chin on the hook of his umbrella. Your aunt is a young and beautiful woman. Is it because of my sisters and me? Is what because of your dear sisters and you? I mean, if she didn't have us to bring up, maybe she would have gotten married a long time ago. The butler dismissed the thought. Stuff and nonsense. Sarah said once it was because of us. Dear Miss Sarah is mistaken. I have no doubt that your Aunt Arabella is merely waiting for the right gentleman to come along. And I dare say he'll be delighted to gain two fine nieces and a stalwart young nephew. Constance said Aunt Arabella was in love once, but he died and she never got over it. 
Dear Constance is mistaken, I'm sure, Praiseworthy replied softly. No, let's have no more talk. Look, look there, aren't those sharks? Sharks were, I'm um, sorry, sharks they were, and Mountain Jim, who was fishing, caught one. He called the cook, and Mr. Azaria Jones gasped. You're not going to eat that thing, are you? I sure am, answered Mountain Jim. If he had the chance, he'd eat me, wouldn't he? Another week passed, and Mr. Azaria Jones's 18 barrels of potatoes began to spoil in the hold. I'm ruined, he wailed, pacing the hot decks. His heavy face hung slack under a large straw hat. Nonsense, said Praiseworthy out for a stroll. I'm a poor man, groaned the Yankee trader. I had every cent I own in those potatoes. I tell you, I'm ruined. Then you must sell them, remarked the butler, who wished only to be of service. Sell spoiled potatoes? My good friend, it's clear you know nothing about trade. Not a thing. Who do you think will buy them? I haven't the faintest idea, said Praiseworthy, but that's only because I haven't given the matter any thought. It was a naughty problem, even for Praiseworthy. The next day, the French immigrant, Monsieur Gaunt, could be seen pacing the decks in one direction while Mr. Azaria Jones paced it in the other. Mon Dui, declared the Frenchman, I'm ruined. My grape cuttings are drying up and the captain will not give me a drop of fresh water to keep them alive. I'm ruined. Then you must water them, said Praiseworthy. Water them, exclaimed the Frenchman. Water them, you say? With what, Monsieur? Why, with water, replied the butler. The Frenchman shook his head. I have fifty gold pieces in my money belt, but a thousand gold pieces will not buy me a drop of fresh water on this ship. We must find a way, said Praiseworthy. Fresh water and coal lay waiting a thousand miles further north at the port of Callao on the coast of Peru, but the Lady Wilma seemed rooted to the spot, be calmed and motionless. All that day, Praiseworthy racked his brain. Fine men, Monsieur Gaunt and Mr. Azaria Jones, the butler told himself, and something must be done to help them. But even if a stiff wind came up, the gold ship could hardly make port soon enough to save the grape cuttings. And not even in Callao, Praiseworthy supposed, could he find a buyer for 18 barrels of spoiled potatoes. Indeed, Master Jack, said Praiseworthy, I seem to be a failure in my first attempt at both trade and agriculture. I suppose we should, at the very least, reimburse Mr. Azaria Jones for the few raw potatoes we helped ourselves to as stowaways. Suddenly, Jack's eyebrow shot up. A thought bolted from him like lightning. He was unable to speak for a full three seconds. Praiseworthy, he exclaimed, that's it. That's what? You've got it. Got what? At that moment, Mr. Azaria Jones came pacing down the deck from one direction while Monsieur Gaunt came pacing from the other. Jack quickly explained in Praiseworthy's eyes, instantly lit up. Gentlemen, said the butler, holding up his umbrella to stop the Yankee trader and the Frenchman. Master Jack here tells me I have hit upon a marvelous notion. Why, it's so simple. A boy could have thought of it. What's this? asked Mr. Azaria Jones, his hands clasped hopelessly behind his back. Monsieur Gaunt, said Praiseworthy, as your agricultural adviser, I suggest that you buy Mr. Azaria Jones's 18 barrels of potatoes. They're a bit spoiled, but a good bargain. Potatoes, exclaimed the Frenchman. Don't make jokes, Monsieur. It's no joke, I assure you, said Praiseworthy. Confound it, Praiseworthy, grumbled the Yankee trader. No one is going to pay me for my spoiled potatoes. Nonsense, said the butler. Spoiled the potatoes may be, but juicy they are, sir. Master Jack can attest to that. While they're like fat raindrops and brown skins. Monsieur Gaunt, you need only poke each of your grape cuttings into a plump potato. I dare say they will stay alive all the way to Callao. The Frenchman and the Yankee trader stood facing each other in the sun, and broad smiles crept over their slack, gloomy faces. I'll buy your potatoes, exclaimed Monsieur Gaunt. I'll sell my potatoes, exclaimed Mr. Azaria Jones. I'm saved, said one. I'm saved, said the other. 
and the bargain was struck on the spot. Jack remained silent, but stuck his hands in his pocket and felt proud of himself. Why, if he hadn't been a stowaway, if he hadn't slaked his thirst with the potatoes at hand, why, some future hillside would be left without a vineyard. Gentlemen, said Mr. Azaria Jones, beaming at Praiseworthy and Jack, you'll need a few tools in the gold fields. When we reach Callao, I'm going to buy you the best pick and shovel to be had. On the contrary, corrected the Frenchman, it is I who will buy them the best pick and shovel in Callao, in all of Peru. With that, Monsieur Gaunt hurried to the hold and busied himself with the jackknife. He cut holes in the potatoes and clipped in grape cuttings like so many straws. The next morning, a mid from the south came up, and the Lady Wilma's canvas swelled out in great white billows. A happy shout went up, and the ship began to move through the sea. For days after that, Mr. Azaria Jones stopped anyone who would listen to say, Remarkable pair, praiseworthy in the lad. Both traders, you know. Imagine finding a buyer for 18 barrels of spoiled potatoes. Snapping winds drove the ship into ever warmer latitudes. Soon the Argonauts were down to shirt sleeves again, and a growing excitement took hold of them as if they could smell land in the air. Men began to trim their beards and wash their clothes. Callao stood ten days ahead. In his stocking cap, Jack was taking on the aspect of a young sailor. The salt air and the wind had toughened his face. His eyes narrowed with a look of distance in them. He wandered higher and higher into the riggings, exploring the mysteries aloft. The foot ropes and shrouds and blocks. More than once, the boatswain, a bantam with a voice like a frog's, chased him down, but it was like trying to keep a boy out of a backyard tree. Hanging on to a yard arm, Jack was the first to notice a white speck on the horizon from behind the Lady Wilma. The speck grew into sails, and the sails into a ship, and the ship turned out to be the Sea Raven. She's gaining on us, shouted Master uh, Mountain Jim. By noon, the sea raven was alongside, skimming lightly over the seas. The wind seemed to pick her up and carry her along like a feather. Blast, roared Captain Swain, and me half sunk in the water with building bricks. Bricks! I've got a notion to dump them overboard. By dusk, the sea raven was gone, beyond the horizon, far ahead. And that is the end of chapter six. Tomorrow, we will read chapter seven. See you guys then. Bye.